well, first of all, Carol, thank you for the invitation. It's a, a pleasure and a privilege to be able to talk to you guys about uh, the work that we're doing in equity and why I think it's important, what I think it means for uh, the purpose-built community work. Thank you to the Woodlawn team for uh, uh, hosting us. It was really wonderful. Uh, you guys should give them a hand, actually. Um, really grateful to be able to see the work that you're engaged in. We met in, in Atlanta and you had the opportunity, I had the opportunity to hear about what you were doing, but there's nothing like actually seeing it. Uh, and the only other thing I have to say is I don't know whose idea it was to have me follow Nick. <laughs> Nick, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your story and, and I know that's not easy, and, uh, but it's really inspirational not only to hear your story but also see uh, the work that's going on here. Um, I had some very uh, profound things to say to you all uh, a beer and two glasses of wine ago. <laughs> so now you just get what you get. Um, but the, the one thing I did want to say though is that it really uh, is an honor to be here because the, the purpose built work and one of the reasons why I'm so involved in it and all in as Carol uh, said is that because um, it really aligns well with kind of my upbringing. I, uh, on my mother's side of the family, uh, I grew up in a, a group of people who were organizers and activists and teachers and people who were really uh, immersed in uh, the community work in the place that I grew up in, which is Oakland, California. Um, and you know, at an early age, I was really introduced to uh, the concepts of economic justice and social justice uh, and racial uh, justice and my my parents went as far as to send me to the school in Oakland that was founded and run by the Black Panther Party, uh, so you can kind of get a sense of the the environment that I was in. I was the little kid in the back of the color in the back of the room at the community meeting with the coloring book, wondering why everybody was so upset and when we could go home. <laughs> um, I also though uh, my my father my father's side of the family was uh, my grandfather and grandmother were from South Carolina. Uh, neither one of them really uh, finished middle school and they moved to Harlem as soon as they uh, were old enough to do so. Uh, and my grandfather used to tell me uh, two things and there, there are a few people in the room who know me and they've heard me say this often. Uh, the first, who, is he, who here is from New York? All right, so you'll appreciate this. My grandfather told me almost every day that when you leave New York, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> The other thing he told me was, if it's not a Cadillac, it's not a car. <laughs> and, and for me, what that meant was that my grandfather had this really strong connection to Harlem uh, and that community and what it meant. And so the work of purpose-built communities, to me, uh, is about combining uh, that focus on uh, economic justice and social justice and equality and opportunity with place uh, and thinking about my my grandfather. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is the work that we've been doing and I wanted to kind of do four things. One is I wanted to kind of talk about equity and, and kind of define the term a little bit for you. Uh, and I want to do that because, um, you know, I've been involved in this work quite a bit and it's been striking to me uh, the number of people who talk about equity and uh, the work. But then at the same time, I see all these blog posts and people posting things saying, ah, you know what, I don't really know what equity means. Uh, and so I want to kind of do some, just kind of give you my sense of what the, what the word means and what it doesn't mean. The other thing I want to do is kind of talk about the Bay Area for a little while. Our work has really been focused in on responding to uh, the issues and the data and the challenges and the opportunities in the Bay Area. Uh, and I wanted to share a little bit of that data with you and kind of give you a sense of what we're responding to uh, in San Francisco. Uh, I also want to kind of give you a glimpse into what we're doing at the San Francisco Foundation because we have literally uh, pushed all of our chips into the middle of the table around achieving equity, uh, racial equity, economic inclusion at a regional level of scale. Uh, and then I want to close by kind of giving you a sense of what I think uh, equity looks like within the context of actually implementing purpose-built community uh, projects. Diversity is a fact. Inclusion is a practice. Equity is the goal. Uh, and I start with this because, 
you know, often some of these terms get confused and start to get jumbled together, but I just wanted to spend some time talking about this for a second. So diversity, what is diversity? It's broadly defined as demographic mix, a specific collection of people taking into account elements of human difference. So that's diversity. All right, inclusion. Inclusion is a practice. It's the practice of creating a greater sense of belonging to a community and providing the platform for diverse individuals to participate fully in decision-making processes. But equity is the goal. Equity is the just and fair inclusion into a society where everyone and all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. But that's a bunch of words. If you're like me, um, one of the things that's actually really good is to kind of get a sense of pictures and how it is. And this is one of the things that I think is important um, in terms of distinguishing equity from equality. I think people kind of uh, throw the terms together a little bit, but this is a picture that kind of gives you a sense of how they're different. On the left is equality. Uh, everybody's trying to reach the apple. Uh, and you know, we have an approach here in America that really talks about equality and really lifting that up, up is important. But if equity is the goal, it's not just about making sure that everybody has a box. It's about making sure that everybody can get an apple. Uh, and when you think about it in that way, this is equity. Equity means you give everybody what they need in order to reach the goal. Another way to think about it, I like to think about it in terms of shoes. Equality is everybody in here having a shoe. Equity is everybody having a shoe that fits. That's what equity is. Uh, and I just want to stay here for a little while, and I want to lift up real two important elements of what equity is and how it kind of plays out in practice. The first is that equity compels you to focus in on the most vulnerable. Compels you to focus in on the most vulnerable. If you think about that tree, it's the shortest person that needed the most help to get that apple. But the second, and I think if there's anything, if there's anything I want you to remember about uh, equity and why it's important and how you think about it, is that when you actually meet the needs of the most vulnerable among us, we all benefit. When we meet the needs of the most vulnerable among us, we all benefit. Who here um, knows about curb cuts? Curb cuts, right? Who here knows the origins of curb cuts? Curb cuts came from the advocacy uh, in the world of people with disabilities so that people who had mobile disabilities could access the streets and sidewalks uh, in just the same way that everybody else could. But how many times have you seen the lawyer with the brief, with the full of suitcases, using the curb cut to get to their meeting? How many times have you seen the young mother with the baby carriage use the curb cut to get to where she was going? How many times have you seen the caterers with their carts trying to get to their event using the curb cuts? I can go on and on and on. But the point is, the curb cuts came from the advocacy to make sure that the most vulnerable among us would have access to the streets and be able to move around just like everybody else. And that curb cut principle is the principle that we need to apply when we're thinking about equity uh, and thinking about the work. Just think about that, the curb cut principle. If you take a school district or a school, the school that can meet the needs of the most vulnerable kid in the classroom is gonna be a school that provides fabulous economic or educational opportunities to all the students in that, in that school. The health system, the health system that makes sure that it can meet the health needs of the folks who are the most likely to be sick or have the lowest life expectancy is gonna be the health system that makes sure that everybody is healthy. And let's think about law enforcement. How about this? I bet you it's the law enforcement or criminal justice entity that recognizes that Black Lives Matter is the same entity that's going to treat everybody with dignity and respect. 
All right. So it's this concept of the curb cuts and meeting the needs of the most vulnerable, but the fact that if you meet the needs of the most vulnerable, we all benefit. That's a very important, and I would say probably the most important aspect when you think about equity. I'm going to skip this for a minute. Actually, I'm going I'm to stay here for a little while. Um, role of philanthropy. I work for the San Francisco Foundation. We've been doing a lot of thinking uh, about what this means for us, uh, and we're not alone uh, in that. Uh, you know, Ford Foundation says that they believe in the inherent de dignity of all people, uh, but around the world, too many people are excluded from political, economic, and social institutions to shape their lives. Other foundations who picked up this kind of uh, focus include Weingart, Rockefeller, Kellogg, MacArthur, Heron, I can list a, a whole lot of them. Uh, but the point is, there are a lot of folks that are moving in this direction. Um, and we are too. And, we, and when we thought about what this was going to mean for us, we did a lot of work. We did a lot of community meetings. We brought experts into the foundation to talk about this stuff. But we also looked at the data. And I just wanted to share a couple of things uh, about the Bay Area, uh, data-wise, that are really interesting. We looked at uh, the Bay Area region in relationship to about 150 of the largest kind of metropolitan areas. Uh, and I hope you can see this. Um, we, uh, in the five counties that we work in, which are Alameda, Contra Costa County, San Francisco, Marin, San Mateo. We are the second most uh, diverse uh, region uh, in the country, uh, with, and we're second only to v Vallejo and Fairfield, which is about, it's our neighbor, basically. Uh, and just a, a word about this is that I think is important for all of us to understand is the projections indicate that by 2042, we are going to be a country that is majority people of color. Uh, we live in California, uh, in San Francisco, and California is ahead of the, of the nation. Uh, and in the Bay Area, we're actually uh, ahead of California. We're about 52 percent uh, people of color. At the same time, uh, we are also home uh, to some of the most, um, or actually I would say we're almost ground zero for the kind of income and wealth inequality that all the hand wringing is going on in this country about nowadays. This is. Uh, we're 14 uh, out of uh, 150 here. One thing I would say about this is that um, this is, wasn't always the case in the Bay Area. Uh, there was a time, if you looked at this data in 1970, our income distribution uh, in the Bay Area was better or more equal uh, than the state of California. The state of California was better or more equal uh, than um, uh, the nation. We are now the inverse of that. Uh, California's income and wealth distribution is more unequal than uh, the nations in the Bay Area uh, is worse than California. So uh, we are dealing with this. And the thing that reason I wanted to mention this is because on the one hand, uh, we are uh, the place in the country that is uh, ground zero for uh, diversity, but we are also ground zero for uh, not only income and wealth inequality, but how that impacts us in terms of race. Um, one of the things that we looked at, and we have all kinds of data that we uh, went through, but this was one slide that I thought was uh, particularly uh, interesting when you start to look at race. What this shows uh, is uh, median hourly wage uh, by educational attainment, uh, and it shows a trend line on that. And you can acquaint yourself with this for a little bit, but I'm going to give you the punchline and the part of this that was probably most disturbing to me, and that is that as you get more education, yes, education is the great equalizer because you, everybody across the board gains in terms of their economic potential. However, uh, once you get on the far right-hand side here, um, you start to see, actually it's across the board, but that education is not the leveler when it comes to, to race. Uh, and in the Bay Area, in fact, if you are Latino with a BA, you are likely to learn, earn about $9 less per hour than your white colleagues with the same level of education. So part of this is about income and wealth, but part of this is clearly about race. And there was a, there was a question that was asked a little bit earlier uh, when Carol was doing her presentation about um, how is it that we can begin to talk about this issue of economic justice and racial justice and equity uh, 
in terms that go beyond the moral imperative. Uh, I told you about my upbringing, so I actually think that this is very much a moral imperative uh, and an ethical issue, but I also think it's an economic imperative. And you can look at it in a lot of different ways. This is one way to look at it, and this is something that uh, Policy Link and a group called the uh, Program for Environmental Racial Equity in uh, USC did for us, but it just said, what would it look like? What would the Bay Area's economy look like if we just close uh, the racial income gap? And what it shows here uh, is that there would be $117 billion more circulating uh, in the Bay Area economy if we uh, just did that. So uh, I think the moral to that story is um, that there are economic benefits associated with this. Uh, and I've actually been saying this, uh, that the Bay Area is doing well, uh, but we're fooling ourselves uh, if we think that we can continue to rely on a smaller and smaller group of people to actually carry the economy. Uh, so we may be doing well, but there's a cliff somewhere. I don't know where it is, but there's a cliff out there uh, if we continue with the trajectory that we're on today. So our focus has been uh, to really achieve racial and economic inclusion and equity at a regional level of scale at the San Francisco Foundation. Uh, and we embarked on that journey about a year ago. Uh, and we've arrived in some really interesting places. And I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Um, the first is that um, we think that one of the, the key pathways, and I'll start at the top there, is really about expanding access to opportunity. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, that in a minute. We also think if you look on the left-hand side here that the place matters. Uh, it's either going to be a springboard to opportunity, it could be a sentence to the lack of opportunity, and we need to think about how we're responsive to that. But also, involvement matters, voice matters, uh, engagement matters. And so we created an area called Nurturing Equity Movements. And this is how we are organized. We used to be organized around things like community development and community health and arts and culture and education and environment. We are now organized around these three things which we think are the pathways to equity. And if we put it in shorthand, the way we've been talking about it is that it's about people, place, and power. And that at the intersection of these concepts of people, place, and power is where equity occurs. So let me talk about people for a minute. As you saw from the other slide, uh, the people aspect of the work for us is about expanding access to opportunity. And we are thinking about that in a variety of ways, but I just wanted to uh, share a couple with you. One is removing systemic barriers to opportunity, whether that's involvement in the criminal justice system, uh, your legal status or your documented status, whether you're documented or undocumented in terms of being an immigrant, your ability to access high quality education, raising the floor for low wage workers. We've been supporting a lot of minimum wage campaigns. Uh, also, we've been thinking about how we can foster a greater sense of upward economic mobility by connecting people to high growth, high wage sectors in the Bay Area economy. Uh, and the last thing is we're moving, uh, removing um, physical barriers to opportunity. So it takes us into places where we are thinking about land use decision making and transportation policy and infrastructure investment and making sure that we're making decisions as a region that try to address uh, equity rather than uh, continue to exacerbate it. Under place, as I said, where you live, uh, unfortunately, it's true, uh, can play a big factor in your ability to access opportunity. So we have adopted a very uh, explicit focus in on place anchor institutions, addressing housing and displacement issues and affordable housing issues. We think that this is a really important part of the work. Uh, and then last is power uh, thing. Uh, and the way I like to talk about this is we think that civic engagement, voter participation, community organizing, leadership development are all important to really kind of move the ball around the people and place stuff. But it's also just an important aspect of the work in general. So we felt so much, so strongly about it that we created uh, its own area of work. Uh, and really, uh, we think that through that, I mean, it's, it's great to have great ideas uh, and we know what works. Um, but if those great ideas and important interventions and effective interventions are not connected to authentic demand, they're not connected to constituency, we don't believe that they're sustainable nor do we think that they get the scale, at the level of scale it'll make an impact. And so the power piece is really important. Last thing on kind of what we're doing at the foundation that I want to focus in on is we have been thinking just as much about our role 
uh, as we have uh, about what we're going to focus in on. And it takes us to a, an interesting place. So at our core, uh, we've got about 1.3 billion in assets, 800 million of that is endowment. And so that endowment allows us to do discretionary grant making and that's a core part of what we do. It will continue to be a core part of what we do. Um, we also though, um, as a community foundation, facilitate the philanthropy of others. Uh, and we have uh, $500 million at the foundation of donor advised funds representing about 600 different funds and 900 different individuals. And we think that's also an important part of our work. And in fact, we think that uh, donors to the San Francisco Foundation benefit from, will get engaged by and passionate about the work that we're doing with the Foundation's endowment to achieve equity. And so our goal is not only to involve donors and give them the opportunity to be involved with this agenda, but we would love to, love to tap into the leadership role that donors play in their respective communities and the influence that they have around this agenda as well. So we view ourselves as working with donors in a more dynamic way than we have in the past. Last thing I want to say about our role is we're grant maker, we're facilitator of philanthropy, but in order to achieve what we're trying to achieve on this agenda, it requires us to step into a more visible, a more robust, a more strategic civic leadership role. We have to engage uh, unlikely suspects unusual suspects, the private sector. We have to make sure uh, that we are working with the public sector as much as we bring philanthropy to the table around this issue. It pales in comparison to what the public sector spends on the issues that we care about. And so we are fooling ourselves if we think we can do it without engaging that sector. Uh, but we also think that we need to do a better job of mining what we're learning and sharing that with the field. And we also think that we can use communications not only to toot our own horn and let people know that in the Bay Area that we are here in a vehicle for them, but we need to use communications as a strategic programmatic tool to shape the public discourse around these issues as well. So what does this mean uh, to me in terms of equity and inclusion and purpose-built communities? Um, as Carol said, you know, I, I chair the board in, in Oakland and so Alice, I know Alice is probably here somewhere, she and I and the board have been doing a lot of thinking uh, about purpose-built communities and its intersection with equity. And I just want to lift up five or six things that I think are really uh, important uh, for us in Oakland and probably important for you and your communities as well, uh, if you're kind of bringing this uh, focus. One is we create mixed-income communities in an additive way. What do I mean by that? Uh, in all of our communities, there are so many families who have lived through years of disinvestment and neglect. It would be a crime to turn these communities around and not have them be able to benefit from the, from the positive aspects of our work. The second, and when we think about the, the cradle, the college pipeline, we got to do that by meeting the needs of the most vulnerable in that pipeline. Uh, we're not about creating better outcomes in the schools uh, because we've been able to flip the demographics of the school. Uh, we want this to be about making sure that the young people who have not had access to high quality education are at the front of the line for these new schools when they're having improved outcomes and that their growth is at what's at the forefront, the tip of the spear. Whether it's housing or education or health, we've got to be about understanding the impact of our work by race. Uh, so we've got to have data that's disaggregated by race and use that to drive our decision making. But when we talk about what we're accomplishing, we need to be able to talk about it in terms of race as well. How are those kids doing in these schools that we're creating? Um, it's got to be informed and driven by residents. We saw the video of Ms. Davis earlier. Ms. Davis has to be at the center of our work in every community that we're working in. Uh, and it has to be informed by the knowledge and wisdom of the residents that we're working with. And it's gotta, if it's going to be for them, they got to be involved in the decision making process. The quarterback organization has to be an organization that has strong tentacles in the community and reflective of the communities that we're serving if we're really going to be about equity. And then the last thing, uh, and you know, this is 
I hesitate about saying this because this is hard work. Going deep in a neighborhood is hard. Transforming it in the ways that we are seeking to do it is hard. But you know what? If we're really thinking about equity, just doing it in our neighborhoods is not enough. So the last piece around equity is we've got to be able to talk about what we're doing, mind what we're learning in our purpose-built communities, but it can't end at the neighborhood border. Uh, you shouldn't have to be in Atlanta privileged enough or lucky enough to have a Tom Cousins in order for your housing to be decent and the services that you are seeking being responsive to you. That, the system should be making that happen. Uh, our public systems need to be engaged in that way. Our private sector partners need to be engaged in that way. Philanthropy needs to be engaged in that way for all the young kids in the city, not just the purpose-built communities. And so that is, for me, the six set of things that I think are really important for us to think about. And again, I just want to uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, thank you for opening your doors and letting me see the Woodlawn community uh, today. And again, thank you, Nick, for sharing your story. Thank you. Thank you.